there's no question that Swift was Irish. He lived in Ireland. He became the Dean of St. Patrick's. And even though he spent a good deal of time in England working for the Tories, writing for the Tories, his heart was in Ireland. Ireland, to all extent and purposes, was a conquered country. William III in 1690 at the Battle of Boyne had finally brought Ireland under English rule. But unlike Scotland in 1707, Ireland did not gain its independence, or I'm sorry, Ireland did not become a regular part of the Commonwealth until 1800, 1801. Pardon me? All right. Um, 1801. Now, the English had certain rules about Ireland. Ireland could produce staples, but they couldn't produce finished goods. And consequently, the balance of trade was always very bad with Ireland. Ireland was an impoverished country. No wonder that people were fleeing Ireland and coming to the United States in order to make a living in the 18th century, later on in the 19th century with the failure of the potato crop. Ireland also was a country that England was, you might say, cheating in terms of its coinage. In one instance, uh, England allowed to let a man by the name of Woods coin uh, Irish money. Swift opposed it. He opposed the Woods Pence, and he wrote a series of letters called the Draper, the Draper's Letters, as though he were a person creating drapes. And he opposed this law. England felt that the, the English government felt that this opposition was treasonous, and they offered a heavy fine for anyone, a heavy reward for anyone who could prove that Swift was the Draper. Although many, many Irishmen knew who wrote these papers, no one would turn in Jonathan Swift, and he won the day. Now you have to remember that Swift is Anglican, living amongst Anglican populations in North Ireland, while Ireland is primarily a Roman Catholic country. The Irish were so bled, said Swift, by these economic pressures, by these economic strictures. There were even ships placed around Ireland to prevent them from carrying on normal trade with other countries. That Swift finally wrote a modest proposal. Now, the modest proposal says a very simple thing. The Irish have no more crops. The Irish have no more resources. The Irish have no natural, no more, uh, uh, have lost their natural resources, have expended their natural resources. What else do they have to sell except babies? Roman Catholics don't believe in birth control and consequently they have babies. These babies at the age of 12 years old aren't very productive. They don't have jobs. They become beggars of the streets. But at one year old, these babies are about the size of small turkeys. And you can sell them to, for food to the British. And that's the argument that Swift is offering in what he calls a modest proposal. Now, a modest proposal is a pro modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people from being a burden to their parents or the country and for making them beneficial to the public. I've already mentioned to you the, uh, the state of the Irish economy. Now, strangely enough, even in this country, because 
families couldn't support their children or because many of the children were born under improper circumstances there were many abortions and of course the Roman Catholic Church would have opposed the abortions so Swift starts out with a very logical statement if we find a way of making these babies productive we will reduce abortions in the land now how does he go about making this argument he uses verisimilitude. Verisimilitude is giving us the sense of the truth. And he uses, by, he uses it by giving us statistical verification. If you know that 25% of the people will do something, and 33% of the people will do not, and 18% will do something else, you, so, you, you seem to trust these statistics compiled by the government. Well, Swift says there are one and a half million Irishmen and 200,000 are women capable of breeding. 30,000 of these women are capable of rearing their own children, giving them a livelihood, putting clothes on their back, providing them schooling, making sure that they're productive in society which leaves 170,000 women now who are capable of breeding. But there are 50,000 a year who miscarry or whose children die within the year. Consequently, we now have 120,000 people capable of breeding. That's a lot of turkeys. That's a lot of children. And what Swift says is, if you come down to realizing that the animal kingdom eats meat, while a 12-year-old boy is not marketable, a 1-year-old child is delicious, nourishing, and wholesome, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled. In fact, some of these babies can be turned into a nice fricassee or a ragu. He says it costs two shillings a year to raise a beggar's child at the cost of the state. This is welfare. By the way, it's an interesting note. In the 18th century, one out of every eight people in England was on some kind of dole. One out of eight people in England depended on the parish or depended on the government to support himself. Today, I think the United States ratio is one out of 16. So we have actually increased by 100%, or decreased by 100%, the number of people dependent upon the government for, its, uh, uh, for their existence. Now what is the rationale for having this policy? Number one, remember, Swift is appealing to the English and the English are Anglicans. The Anglicans are opposed to the French and the Spanish Roman Catholic countries. And consequently, Englishmen should favor the idea that selling these babies, 120,000 babies, will lessen the number of Roman Catholics in the land, Papists in the land. Number two, where the poor have no furniture, where the poor have little in their homes, where the poor barely have enough fuel to warm themselves in the winter, you are now giving them something of value. And that's their babies. By virtue of having this number of children available, for food on the table, you are increasing the nation's wealth. In addition, if a woman produces more than one child continuously, has a number of children, each of whom she sells, then she has no need of paying for a child's upkeep. 
she could make her profit, earn her living, and have no worry about rearing these children. Secondly, uh, fifth, you now have a new dish to serve at taverns and inns. You pick up the newspaper and you read the new menus that McDonald's is providing, that uh, the various restaurant chains are developing to reduce fat in foods. You read about the fancy restaurants downtown that are now establishing themselves around Minute Maid Stadium. And you need chefs who create new types of foods for gourmet diners. And the sixth point is you now have an inducement for marriage. The fact of the matter is that very few people actually entered into marital ceremonies in the uh, Protestant church. It got so bad at some point that in 1751 the Anglican church ruled that you, could, you must get married in a church and you must have a marriage certification. Uh, most people, unless they were being married for the advantage of families or for economic purposes, simply cohabited and that consists of the marriage. And the marriage institution as we know it today is a uh, relatively new, uh, certainly in English culture, amongst the common people and amongst the poor. Now let's just make go back to another economic advantage here. While it costs two shillings per year to raise a beggar's child, a wealthy man is willing to pay ten shillings alone just for four meals for his family. Consequently, the disparity between those who are very rich and those who are very poor is considerable and you can get a lot of money for these children. Now the argumentation is very clear. Let's look on page 428 of your text where we have the logical and clear explication of how circumstances will improve society. He says, first, as I have already observed, it would greatly lessen the number of papists with whom we are yearly overrun, being the principal breeders of the nation, as well as our most dangerous enemies. Remember, Swift's Irish. But he's recognizing that the papists among us, among the Irish, are our most dangerous enemies. And who stay at home on purpose with a design to deliver the kingdom to the pretender. They want to bring James II and James II's family back to England to rule the throne of England. And they're hoping to take advantage by the absence of many good Protestants who have chosen rather to leave their country than to stay at home and pay tithes against their conscience to the Episcopal cause. What is Swift saying? Swift is saying <clears throat> in England there are a lot of Protestants who are not Anglican. They don't want to become England. They're going they're Anglican. They're going to America. They don't want to pay tithes. They don't want to support the Anglican Church. Let's find some way to improve the economy of Ireland so that we can make more money. It all sounds very logical. Look at number six. This would be a greater inducement to marriage, which all wise nations have either encouraged by rewards or enforced by laws and penalties. It would increase the care and tenderness of mothers toward their children when they were sure of a settlement for life to the poor babes, provided in some sort by the public to their annual profit. Women would pay more attention to their children when they're being raised this first year. They would love them. They would endear themselves to them. They would make sure they're well fed. They would take care of them. They would wash them. They would bathe them. Because after a year, they could sell them for a profit. Whereas women 
tended to ignore their children, and whereas many of the women had malnourished children. What else do we find here? We should soon see an honest emulation among married women. Which of them could bring the fattest child to the market? You're going to have competition. Who's going to win at the fair with the fattest child, the healthiest child, the richest child, the child with more meat on his body than anyone else? And finally, he's a very logical person, Swift, as he delivers this talk. He says, there are some people who would argue against this proposal. They would think it's unreasonable. It's only a modest proposal. He says, those who would argue against me, let them come up with a plan on how to feed and clothe 100,000 useless mouths and backs. And let them come up with a plan to decrease the national debt. If they can't do it, then my plan affords an answer. Now, let's talk about this for a moment. Is there anyone here who believes that Swift meant what he said? Mr. Hallmark? Is Mr. Hallmark here? Press the button on the desk. Do you, do you think there's anyone who believed that Swift really intended to have this happen? I seriously doubt that he actually wanted him to do this. I think it was just a proposal to mock what was going on in the Times. Yeah. Obviously. Obviously. If anyone ever thought that Swift intended to sell babies for food, he would consider himself a madman, he would consider Swift a madman. But this is an irony. Now, an irony is a kind of document which on paper says one thing, but which informs you intuitively that you must believe the opposite. Irony is a special type of genre in literature. Now, if you look on the screen here, you'll see that there are various types of ironies. There is a local irony, and there is infinite irony. Now, the local irony here is the Irish. You recognize the population. You recognize the problem of uh, feeding people. You recognize the disparity between I the I Irish people and the English people. You recognize the way that the English are oppressing the Irish. And so it's a local irony because you can identify the locale. You can identify the immediate politics. You can identify the problems. An infinite irony would be the book of Job in the Hebrew Scriptures, for example, where God meets with Satan and Satan says, God is pleased to see a man by the name of Job who really believes in him. And Satan says, you think Job believes in you, but that's because he's rich, he has a great family, he has crops, he's well fed, and his family is well sustained, but take away his house, take away his family, take away his crops, take away his health, and you'll see how much he really believes in God. And then God tells Satan, according to the book of Job, well, you can do anything to Job you want except kill him. And that's what happens. Job loses everything but still maintains his faith. Well, that's cosmic irony. That's an irony beyond any locale. That's a, 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 an irony that is philosophically, teleologically, theologically, ontologically beyond what anyone can pinpoint as being a single political or geographical act. Secondly, there is overt irony and covert irony. This is what we would call overt irony. As Mr. Hallmark has pointed out, it's obvious that no one really believes that you're going to kill babies 
uh, and, and serve them for food, as opposed to covert irony. We previously discussed Daniel Defoe's shortest way with his dissenters, where he came up with a policy to get rid of dissenters that Tories liked and high churchmen liked, and they favored it, and they thought it was a great argument until they realized it was written not by a Tory but by a Whig, and not by a churchman but by a Presbyterian dissenter. And then they realized that they were taken in. But it took some effort for them to go in, to be taken in. Now the last is stable irony and unstable irony. A stable irony is the kind of irony where the narrator or the speaker is always expressing the view of the author in a sustained manner, even though it's the reverse of what we see on the page. As opposed to Gulliver's Travels, where the narrator is unstable. Remember I told you that Gulliver in the first book is the voice of reason. But in the second book he's emasculated and we no longer accept his voice. And in the fourth book we no longer accept his voice. And in the third book, the satire and science, we have Gulliver completely taken in and gullible for every Lockean understanding, for each scientific invention, for each philosophical act he experiences. So if you're going to analyze a modest proposal, it is, number one, a local irony. Number two, it is an overt irony. And number three, it is a stable irony because everything it says is exactly what Swift believes to the opposite. Now, I'd like you to look at another essay which we're going to uh, talk about for a few moments, which is another prose work before we get to the poetry. And turn to the argument against abolishing of Christianity in England on the web CT page that you would find it on or the sheets in front of you. In 1673, there was an effort to repeal the Test Act. The Test Act was an act that England had forced Charles II to sign, saying that he would observe the Book of Common Prayer and all the rights of the Anglican Church. There was an effort to repeal the Test Act by occasional conformity. Now what was that? There were people who said that occasional conformity was a way of integrating more people into the government because in occasional conformist, conformity you could swear allegiance to the Anglican Church once a year and then to all extent and purposes practice whatever religion you wanted afterwards. Swift totally opposed occasional conformity. He opposed anything that would weaken the Test Act. And so he comes up with an ironic statement, which is an argument against the abolishing of Christianity in England. Now when Swift talks about Christianity, he's talking about one group of people, the Anglicans. He's not talking about the Puritans. He's not talking about the Baptists. He's not talking about the Anabaptists. He's not talking about the Congregationalists. He's not talking about the Presbyterians. He's not talking about the Lutherans. He's not talking about the Quakers. He's not talking about the Puritans. He certainly isn't talking about Deists. He's talking about one group of people who have the rights to the government, who have the rights to enter Cambridge, Oxford, and Trinity, who have the rights to emoluments from the, from the state. Now, when you start to argue against abolishment, then the assumption is that people are going to abolish it. So right away, your argument is ironic 
because no one's trying to abolish Christianity. No one's trying to abolish Anglicanism. And yet, this becomes his premise. Now he says, there are reasons why there are advantages to abolishing Christianity. What are some of the advantages? One of them is you enlarge liberty of conscience, which is limited by the priestcraft. The priests tell you what to believe. The priests tell you how to behave. Abolish the religion. And you don't have anyone coming down on you like that. You don't even have the possibility of blasphemy. Because whom are you going to blaspheme? There is nothing. And consequently, you can live your life in fairly good conscience. Look on page 420 of this document. What, what else is the advantage of abolishing Christianity? He says, it's objected to the gospel system. If you believe in the gospel, it obliges men to believe in things too difficult for free thinkers. Why obey all these laws? Why obey all these strictures when they're so difficult for people to obey? Let's get rid of these strictures. Let's not have gospel voices telling us how to behave. Then we'll be more free and he moves into, the, into that area. What else is the problem with Christianity? He says that there are 200, uh, there are 10,000 parsons in this country who are paid by the state. 10,000 priests, uh, Anglican ministers, paid by the state. Why are you going to pay them all this money? Why are you going to waste money on them when what you can do is take that money and give it to 200 young gentlemen who know how to spend it on wit and pleasure and free thinking, who know how to go through money quickly? Imagine 200 wealthy wits spending the money that 20,000 parsons are paid. Let's let people do what they want. Let's let them what they think. Let's not suffer the burden of these ministers. He says another advantage, this is on page 421 of the text, another advantage is proposed by abolishing Christianity is the clear gain of one day in seven. You get an extra day. Normally on Sunday, you're not allowed to enter recreation. You're not allowed to spend. You're not allowed to go to the market. You should be home praying. But he says that's a waste of time. Look what can happen on Sunday. We can have theaters. We can have more exchanges. We can have bigger marketplaces. We can have public edifices that are open for entertainment and for people to do what they really want to do. Huh. He says it's terrible that people one day a week are forced to stay at home instead of gaming at the chocolate house. He says why aren't there not more taverns and coffee houses open? And then he says are people less inclined to get venereal disease on Sundays than on other days? The words here are, are fewer claps got upon Sundays than other days? There's no proof of that, that Sunday gives us that advantage even. Even, even gives us that advantage. He says, what else would happen if we abolished Christianity? Well, we would get rid of factions. We would get rid of high and low church. We would get rid of Whig and Tory. We would get rid of Presbyterian and Church of England. And therefore people would clog themselves with disputes and with, these internal, uh, with this internal fighting. Well, you see, there are some very good reasons to get rid of the religion.
He says, what else happens on Sundays? He says, it's a, it's a ridiculous custom that people should be suffered to ball one day in seven against the methods that most of us pursue in riches and in pleasure. That is, the priests always rail against what we enjoy. We like to spend. We like to eat a lot. We like to womanize. We like to move about. Why should we listen to priests one day a week, ball, rail, and cut us down? He says... Uh, we're going to get rid of controversy. We're going to get rid of conscience. We're going to get rid of an awful lot of words that we're not allowed to say. The priest tells us we're not to swear. We shouldn't speak in, uh, uh, in ways that are vulgar. Well, you abolish the priests who complain about it and you don't have people who, who are engaging in these activities anymore who ought to be criticized. Lastly, he says, the abolition of Christianity will very much contribute to the uniting of Protestants by enlarging the terms of communion to take in all kinds of dissenters. Well, bring in everybody. It doesn't matter what they believe. It doesn't matter what they're precepts are, what their concepts are, what their laws are. Everyone should come together in one great conglomerate because that's what people want. A mix and not the particulars of a legitimate religious belief. He said, but there are some problems in getting rid of Christianity. One, if Christianity were once abolished, how could free thinkers be able to find another subject so calculated in all points to display their abilities? People who object to formal religion wouldn't have an argument. They wouldn't have a case. They wouldn't have an argument. He says that one of the problems in doing away with Christianity is that the void might be filled by the Romish church. And that might become a problem in our society. In other words, there are advantages and there are disadvantages in the abolishment of Christianity. He concludes by saying, upon the whole, if it shall still be thought for the benefit of church and state that Christianity be abolished, I conceive it may be more convenient to defer the execution to a time and place so we don't disoblige our allies. Our allies are going to really be eager for us to show them the want of faith, to show them the indiscriminate nature of faith, to show them the indifference to faith and God that our country now possesses. He says, in fact, if we do this, and if we think it out carefully, we may form an alliance with the Turks. The Turks are not only strict observers of religious worship, but what is worse, they believe a God which is more, they believe in a God which is more than is required of us, even while we preserve the name of Christians. Now finally, to turn it about, and, and for Swift to say that we must ultimately accommodate people who are more religious than we are, people who believe more than we are, even the Muslims whom Swift and his allies would not otherwise condone. We have Swift performing the ultimate irony. 
Now this work again is local because it is dealing with the test act and with laws of occasional conformity. It seems to be overt for people who really know Swift, but for, for many people it seems like a reasonable, res a reasonable response to irreligion. And so for many people this may be covert. But we know it's a stable irony because Swift doesn't believe a word he's saying and is only mocking those who would deprive the Anglican Church of its sole, single, and uh, uh, ordered, regularized mission to invite all Englishmen to follow the Test Act and to invite all Englishmen to say their prayers according to the Book of Common Prayer. Well, this is vicious writing. The modest proposal is a vicious piece of writing because it is such a bitter attack upon the English and such a strong response in support of the Irish. This particular essay is again vitriolic in its attack upon those who want to weaken the Anglican Church. But notice the argument is so logical. The prose is so matter of fact. The, arg the, the, the lists of, rash of reasons for doing one or the other are so carefully ordered that it all seems reasonable. And that's the nature of irony. That's the nature of irony. It all looks reasonable until you begin to realize it is not. I want to now turn to poetry. And let's turn to, in your text, a description of a city shower. Page 435 of your text. Swift wrote a lot of poetry, as well as prose. We've read Gulliver's Travels. We've read A Modest Proposal. We've read the essay on the abolishment of Christianity. But he also was a poet. One of the genres of poet that's very, poetry that's very popular is the Georgic poem. The Georgic poem was written, the Georgics was written in the year 37 to 30 BCE by the Latin poet Virgil. And if you remember, the Georgics is divided into four parts. It deals with human behavior, it deals with politics, it deals with all kinds of occupations, farming, it shows you how to graft a strong root to a weak root to make the weak root stronger. And it ends with the famous story of Aristius. Aristius was a beekeeper and he produced honey. And the gods liked honey. They wanted honey. This is the symbiosis between the gods and man. And so, in order to get honey from Aristius, the gods gave Aristius wooden shoes. Wooden shoes. A good exchange. Miss, Miss Rivas. Miss Rivas here? Miss Schillings. I've called on you before. Is it a good exchange, honey for wooden shoes? I wouldn't say so. You wouldn't say so. I would say um, shoes would be more practical and more useful. So it is a good exchange. Right. It's also a good exchange because Aristius barefoot can't walk very far. But with shoes on, he can travel the globe. And consequently, the gods gave Aristius access to civilization where Aristius gave gods 
access to the food of libation, milk and honey. Well, whenever you read a poem in the 18th century that deals with occupations, you're dealing with a Georgic poem. And let's look at this poem very briefly at the various types of occupations you find in it. You find Susan is a maid at line 17. You find people shopping at line 33. You find a law student at 35, line 35. You see a seamstress at line 37. You see the Tories and Whigs at line 41. You see the beau, a gentleman who's out on the streets, a lover of line 44. You see coachman, a coachman, that is the a, a Troy, a, a Troy chairman is someone who guides horses in a coach. And the Greeks are customers waiting for the rain to go away. So you get occupations in this, in this particular poem. We're going to look at the poem in just a moment as we look at the occupations. But first, I want to talk a little bit about poetry. This poem is iambic pentameter. That is, the beat on each line is short and long. Da-dum, 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 da-dum. By sure prognostics when to dread a shower. When you have a short beat and a long beat, you have an iamb. If it shifts from a long beat to a short beat, you have a trochee. You've studied this in earlier literature, but sometimes it's good to refresh in it. Then you have five beats to a line, which makes it a pentameter line. And every two lines are rhymed. Therefore, you have a rhyme couplet. Now, one of the books you bought for this course was uh, uh, a study of literary and rhetorical trope literary and rhetorical terms. So we're going to go over a few of these terms just to see what kind of artistry a poet in the 18th century brings to the line. Now you have aphoresis. Aphoresis is when you take two words and combine them to one and eliminate a syllable. So for it was, you have twas. And for it is, you have tis. Then you have characterismus. Anytime you try to derive a character, explain a character, you have this term. And here's a character of human behavior. The clouds are getting filled with water. Ultimately, they're going to rain. When the clouds fill up, they spew out the rain just as a drunk spews out and vomits what he cannot hold. Meanwhile, the south rising with dabbled wings, that is, you have the light clouds at first, a sable cloud athwart the welkin flings. Now, sable is black and welkin is sky. These are older terms adapted in this poem by Swift only to give you a sense of Georgic poetry, to give you a sense of the past, to give you a sense of the kinds of Latin poetry that he's trying to emulate. A sable cloud athwart the welkin flings that swilled more liquor than it could contain and like a drunkard gives it up again. So the water goes in the clouds and the clouds spew it out just as a drunkard drinks his ale and then spews it out himself. The word like a drunkard is a simile. Anytime you use like or as, it's a simile. That's the most popular of techniques. And line 48, he, he calls the people who are inside the store Greeks, just as the Greeks 
entered the Trojan horse, you have Greeks going into the store. And so you have Greeks. Syncope is any time you use a word and eliminate a syllable from a part of the word in order to reduce the rhythm. If you had threatening, you would have three syllables. Threatening. But taking out the middle E, you have threatening, which is a troche, long beat, short beat. And therefore you have uh, a syncope. Or you take care of over, which will be two syllables, you turn it into a one-syllable word for rhyme, so that you only get one beat, and you make it or. That's called syncope. And you have studied these. They are in Lanham's uh, list of literary terms, which is a book we've purchased for the course. You have Latinisms. The rain depends. Now, how can the rain depend? It doesn't depend on anything. The word pendant in Latin means hanging. So when the rain comes down and hangs from the cloud, it depends. And that is called a Latinism. And that, of course, is Latinisms are extensively used in Milton's Paradise Lost. You find them there. Then you have epithets. Epithets are combinations of adjectives and nouns that help you understand a term. So you have pensive cat, describing the cat deciding where he's going to go in line three. And you have contiguous drops. Contiguous drops. The rain comes down one after the other. By the way, David Hume, the philosopher at the end of the, toward the middle of the century, says, there is no cause and effect. Cause and effect is an illusion. All you have is contiguous action. Something happens and then something else happens, right? A car goes through a red light and plows into you. And you say there's a cause and effect. He caused the action and he hit you. Therefore, there's a clear cause and effect. However, it's more contiguous action. He went through the red light, and you happened to be in that place where he hit you. Had you been two seconds earlier, he would not have hit you. Had you been two seconds later, you would have, uh, I mean, two seconds earlier, you would have passed him. Two seconds later, you would have missed him. Therefore, his hitting you is not necessarily cause and effect. It's simply contiguous action. Cause and effect. Uh, you failed to win a race. Is it because you didn't practice hard enough? Is it because the other fellow was faster than you? Is it because the ground slipped out from under you and was mushier than you expected? We don't really know what cause and effect is. But we know there's contiguous action. You're used to running very fast, and suddenly you hit a soft spot, and you're slowed. That's contiguous action. So contiguous drops are simply raindrops coming one after the other, and they're furious. Bully Greeks. If you're militant, you become a bully Greek. And when you refer to the bully Greeks, you're referring to the Trojan War in this particular area. So the same term can have several tropic meanings. The next is isocolon. Now, isocolon is whenever you have a balanced phrase. One phrase balances the other. And you, he says, people are miserable when it rains. Old aches throb. Your hollow tooth will rage. So if you have arthritis, and then you have a tooth that responds to wet weather, you have, a, you have a cavity in your tooth, you'll feel it. Isocolon, he damns the climate and complains of spleen. The weather is pretty bad, and he's in bad temper. 
Then you have climax, where items just build on build and, and build. In England, you didn't have you had open sewers in the streets, and so any slop and any waste would simply drain down the sewers, open sewers, into the Thames River. And here we have the butcher shops spilling out their refuse into the sewers and into the ditches, hoping they'll be drained off by the water. Sweepings from butchers' stalls, dug guts and blood. And finally, the homonym. The same word sounds the same, but they're two different words. Whigs being politicians and wigs being what you wear on your head. So now let's look at this uh, poem and see how it reads a description of a city shower. Now that you know what it's all about, as any Englishman would have known in the 18th century, let's see if it makes sense to you. Careful observers may foretell the hour by sure prognostics when to dread a shower. While rain depends, the pensive cat gives o'er her frolics and pursues her tail no more. Returning home at night, you find the sink strike your offended sense with double stink. Those are the sores. If you be wise and go not far to dine, you spend in coach hire more than save in wine. A coming shower, your shooting corns presage. Old aches throb, your yellow tooth will rage. Go down a few lines. Meanwhile, the south, rising with dabbled wings, a sable cloud athwart the welkin flings that swilled more liquor than it could contain, and like a drunkard, gives it up again. Now, in the morning, people go to work. Brisk Susan whips her linen from the rope while the first drizzling shower is born a slope. She has her clothes hanging out. She wants to bring it in before it gets wet from the rain. Such is that sprinkling which some careless queen flirts on you from her mop, but not so clean. Houses in England had overhangs so people could throw the slop out of the windows onto the sewers. And if you walked under the overhang, you were safe, but if you happened to go toward the sewer and someone threw the slop out, you would get it. Piping went in about the middle of the century as people began to hollow out logs. And uh, fortunately, in Houston, we have piping and plants that process human waste but the odors still become apparent on occasions when the filtration system isn't working properly. <sighs> Go down to about line 27. Ah, where must needy poet seek for aid when dust and rain at once his coat invade? Sole coat where dust cemented by the rain erects the nap and leaves a cloudy stain. Now you're going to have to take your clothes to the cleaners. Now in continu contiguous drops, the flood comes down, threatening with deluge this devoted town. Where do people find shelter? They run to the shops. <clears throat> to shops in crowds, the daggled females fly, pretend to cheapen goods, but nothing buy. They pretend that they're looking at goods when they go in these stores, waiting for the rain to halt but they're not about to buy anything. The Templar spruce, while every spout's a brooch, stays till, stays till tis fair, yet seems to call a coach. He pretends to call a coach. He's, he's acting as though he's going to call a coach. He's waiting, it seems, for a coach, but he's not going to pay for a coach. So he just stays in the store until the rain stops, and then he'll walk home. Others are there. And all kinds of people come together in these stores to get away from the rain. Triumphant Tories and desponding Whigs forget their feuds 
and join to save their wigs. So wigs are saving their wigs. You have the homily in them there, and you get the play on words. Now the end of the poem, of course, sees the rain cleaning out the streets and moving all this garbage, all these, this waste, down to the River Thames. And it's a triumph of epic lists. You see the lists developing as you discover what's going down these sewers. I'll read this last passage. And because the rain is rushing, and because the rain is forcing all this garbage into the river, we have to move fast. Now from all parts the swelling kennels flow and bear their trophies with them as they go. Filths of all hues and odors seem to tell what street they sailed from by sight and smell. They, as a torrent drives with rapid force from Smithfield to St. Polkers, shape their course. And in huge confluent giant at Snow Hill Ridge fall from the conduit prone to Holborn Bridge, sweepings from butchers, stalls, dung, guts, and blood, drowned puppies, stinking sprats, all drenched in mud, dead cats, and turnip tops come tumbling down the flood. That word needs clarity. Dung. Well, it's a triumph of Georgic poetry in the 18th century. To come up with all these occupations, to come up with all these turns of phrases, is a very, very impressive piece of writing. Let's look at one other piece relatively quickly, and then we'll move on to the ladies' dressing room. No one will deny that Swift has many, many images in his poetry which are anti-female and misogynistic. He never married. He did, however, have a very close friend by the name of Rebecca Dingley. Rebecca Dingley took care of his estate in Ireland whenever he was in England. Apparently, she never stayed in the house when he was there. But she did follow him. And uh, he wrote a diary to her, a journal to Stella. Rebecca Dingley was a friend of Esther Johnson, who also lived in the house. Esther Johnson and Rebecca Dingley were a couple. And they stayed together in Swift's home when he was away. Swift wrote a journal to Stella, in which he described his life in England. And he writes to these women a history of events going on in England. It becomes a very, very interesting set of lectures. And he used baby talk in, these, in this journal to Stella as well. He used to call himself Presto. And then he would use baby talk and say, will Ooms love Presto when he returns to Ireland. Here's the ladies' dressing room where he talks about a women, women and their pride. Five hours, and who can do it less in by haughty Celia spent in dressing? Now, when you take the rhyme less in and rhyme it with dressing, it's what we call a hudibrastic rhyme. This is the kind of flippant, funny type of rhyme that was adopted by Samuel Butler in a book called Hudibras. And whenever you see rhyme like that, it's always meant to ridicule and always meant to. Uh, for laughter. The goddess, that's the woman, from her chamber issues arrayed in lace brocades and tissues. Strephon, who found the room was void and Betty otherwise employed, stole in and took a strict survey of all the litter as it lay. So a, her, a boy, a, a, a young man, sneaks into her dressing room to see what it is that women own and women possess. This is reality, as opposed to television, which are the unreality shows. All these unreality shows. We sneak into people's private lives and are admitted to their most secret thoughts. 
while there are three television crews, four television trailers, and while people are starving on the island, over the bank behind them, the television crews are sitting there eating sumptuous meals. So we have unreality television, not reality te television. But what does Streffen find when he enters her dressing room in this reality show? And first a dirty smock appeared beneath the armpits well besmeared. That's not a good picture of this woman. Streffen, the rogue, displayed it wide and turned it round on every side. He's looking at his dirty smock that she's wearing, she's worn. And uh, on such a point, few words are best. And Streffen bids us guess the rest. This is really a dirty piece of clothing this woman wears. But swears how damnedly the men lie in calling Celia sweet and cleanly. Now listen while he next produces the various combs for various uses. Filled up with dirt, so closely fixed, no brush could force away betwixt. The combs are dirty, she doesn't clean them. A paste of composition rare, sweat, dandruff, powder, lead, and hair. All this is in her comb. Sweat, dandruff, powder, lead, and hair. Why lead? Lead was the basis for powder and for makeup the women would wear. Many, many women in the 18th century, by middle age, had found that their noses and their chins were eaten away by the lead, and they were wearing prosthetic noses and prosthetic chins. Uh, Michael Jackson is not the only one. What else do we find? A forehead cloth with oil upon it to smooth the wrinkles on her front. Her alum flower to stop the steams exhaled from sour, unsavory streams when she sweats. You see the streams of sweat in her face. What else does she have? Her gully pots and vials are placed. You see she has all kinds of pots around the place. Some filled with washes, some with paste, some with pomatum paints and slops and ointments good for scabby chops. If your face is scabby, if you've got sores, you have to hide them some way. The basin takes whatever comes, the scrapings of her teeth and gums, a nasty compound of all hues, for here she spits and here she spews. Now, the ladies' dressing room admits us to an entirely different type of atmosphere, the one usually finds in love poetry. And Swift gives us the worst vision he can of women who pretend in their pride to dress well, to dress beautifully, to show themselves up to be fine people, but in reality, if you look in their dressing rooms, you have a Pandora's box of faults. He shows how they cook badly. He talks about the odors of the house as mutton cutlets prime of meats which though with art you salt and beat as laws of cookery require and toast them at the clearest fire if from a down the hopeful chops the fat upon a cinder drops to stinking smoke it turns the flame poisoning the flesh from whence it came so she ruins the meat it's just a, a poem that denigrates women, brings them to understand that all women, no matter how beautiful, how witty, how uh, conversational, ultimately are the same human flesh as anyone else is, and that human flesh without spirit will only be wasted, fodder, and a uh, 
flesh destined for the dust of the grave. The prime line, of course, in the poem, when he recognizes that every human being is basically animalistic. Thus, finishing his grand survey, disgusted Strephon stole away, repeating in his amorous fits, oh, Celia, Celia, Celia shits. This is the reality. But vengeance, God, goddess never sleeping, soon punished Strephon for his peeping. And he himself is punished by being forced into dung. What was Swift saying in this poem? I think he's saying the same as he did in the fourth book of Gulliver's Travels. That without spirit and with pride, man ultimately has lost human value and is no more than flesh to be despoiled and flesh ultimately to be wasted in the grave. I'd like to look at another poem that you have in front of you, and that is Swift's own commentary on his own life. You have in the handout, and people will see it on Web CT. <clears throat> the verses on the death of Dr. Swift. Now Swift knows that he was acerbic. He knows that as a Tory he was hated by the Whigs. He knows that he had political infighting and sometimes was a loser. He knows that he never got to be Archbishop of Canterbury because he was Irish. He felt that was the reason he never got there. And he decides to look upon the way people would look upon him when he is, when he's dead. And so he has this piece of writing that we'll look at relatively briefly. And it starts with the nature of envy. All people are envious, he says, of other people. And they don't want other people to get better, to seem better than they. He says at line 13, we all behold with envious eyes our equal raised above our size. Who would not at a crowded show stand high himself, keep others low? I love my friend as well as you, but would not have him stop my view. Then let him have the higher post, <laughs> I ask, but for an inch at most. Drop down to line 28. Dear honest Ned is in the gout, lies racked with pain, and you without. <laughs> How patiently you hear him groan. How glad the case is not your own. So you'll be nice to people who are in pain, but you're sure happy that they're having it and not you, that they're sharing the pain and not you. He compliments his friends, as I've told you before, he was a friend to Dr. Arbuthnot, the Queen's physician. He was a friend to Bolingbroke, who was forced to flee to France. Line 52, he says, why? And, and he was a friend to John Gay, the playwright. So he says, around line 52, why must I be outdone by Gay in my own humorous, biting way? He's complimenting his friend here. Arbuthnot is no more my friend who dares to irony pretend. But he's laughing. He likes irony. Uh, Arbuthnot wrote a piece called uh, uh, an essay on John Bull in which he ridiculed England. He says, he uses irony which I was born to introduce, refined it first, and showed its use. So he knows he's writing irony. And the ironies we discussed earlier are purposeful, intentional, and well understood. And then he predicts his death at line 73. The time is not remote when I must by the course of nature die. 
when I foresee my special friends will try to find their private ends. So what do people find faulty about Swift? He talks about what he hears people saying. Look at line 99. For poetry, he's past his prime and takes an hour to find a rhyme, plus the other rhetorical trope we've seen. His fire is out, his wit decayed, his fancy sunk, his muse a jade. I'd have him throw away his pen. <laughs> but there's no talking to some men. And so here is Swift playing and toying with himself. And finally the day of his death occurs on pay at line 146. Behold the fatal day arrive. How is the dean? He's just alive. Now the departing prayer is read. He hardly breathes. The dean is dead. Swift predicting how people will react to his death. The news through half the town is run. Oh, everyone's sad. Oh, may we all for death prepare. But the next question is, what has he left? Who's his heir? Who's going to make money off this death? And so Swift is again playing with himself, playing with people's attitudes, making him the butt of the joke. Um, now, who are some of the reactions? Line 179 gives us the Queen's reaction. Remember, the Queen despised the tail of the tub. She thought it was vulgar. And she wouldn't give him the medals. Here's what Swift says. And 179, kind lady Suffolk in the spleen runs laughing up to tell the queen, the queen, so gracious, mild, and good, cries, is he gone? Tis time he should. He's dead, you say? <laughs> Why, let him rot. I'm glad the medals were forgot. Swift holds a grudge. He holds a grudge. And the grudge was against Queen Anne. He has comments to make against charters, Walpole's aid. He talks about those who grieve. And then he talks about those who celebrate Swift's achievements. Turn to 319. Oh, uh, go to line uh, 339. With princes, he kept a due decorum, but never stood in awe before him. So he didn't let people rule his life. He followed David's lesson just in princes, never put thy trust. He didn't trust kings. And would you make him truly sower, provoke him with a slave and power, the Irish Senate, if you named, with what impatience he declaimed. Fair liberty was all his cry. For her he stood prepared to die. Now that's an amazing poem. Swift taking advantage of all his enemies and showing them how they would be pleased with his death, praising all of his friends who would be sad at his death. There is one last poem we won't have really time to look at. It's called The Legion Club, where Swift attacked the Irish Parliament when he was unhappy with their policies. And I want to ask you today whether anyone today is writing poetry quite like this, where he attacks one of the politicians whom he dislikes. This is The Legion Club. And look what he says about one of the politicians. Let Sir Thomas Pendergraft, that rampant ass, stuff his guts with flax and grass. But before the priest he fleeces, tear the Bible all to pieces. At the parson's, Tom, a low boy, worthy offspring of a shoe boy. He is a footman, traitor, vile seducer, perjured rebel, bribed accuser. 
Lay thy paltry privilege aside, sprung by papists and a regicide. Fall a working like a mole, raise the dirt about your hole. He's talking about an Irish politician. Tearing him down, attacking him, calling him corrupt, calling him a deceiver, calling him a man who takes advantage of his friends for his own gain. Do we have poets writing politicians like this about modern politicians? You ask yourself a real question. Why not? Thank you. We'll see you next time.